This is Value Investing. I'm your host, Jun Kim. In this podcast, you'll learn everything related to value investing. Hello, fellow investors. Welcome to another episode of the Value Investing Podcast. On today's show, I want to talk about behavioral biases. I think this is a very important topic for any investors out there. So I hope that this is going to add some value. And what I like to do is I want to talk about behavioral biases through three episodes. So on today's show, I want to talk about cognitive biases from belief, perseverance, errors. On the next episode, I want to talk about cognitive biases from information processing errors. And finally, the next on the next episode, uh, we're going to talk about emotional biases. So I put behavioral biases into these three categories because I thought that it, it would make sense. And it's going to be a very interesting topic. So before we get into the details, let me just give you a quick disclaimer, as always, that this podcast is for entertainment purposes only, and it is your responsibility to consult with your investment professional for any investment decisions. So without further ado, why don't we get started? So I want to talk about the differences between cognitive biases and emotional biases, because I told you that we're going to talk about cognitive biases on today's show and also the next show. And emotional biases will be talked about the following episode. What are the differences between these two? So cognitive errors can be thought of as blind spots or distortions in the human mind. So it comes from faulty reasoning. You have subconscious mental procedures for processing information and cognitive errors could arise from that process. And cognitive errors could be more easily corrected than emotional biases. And errors are logically identifiable. So that's the difference between cognitive errors and emotional errors. And emotional errors, as the name suggests, it's based on your emotions. And even if you know these things exist, it's probably really difficult for you to stop that from happening. So that's why it's so interesting to talk about because when it comes to investing, what matters is not always the knowledge or logic. What matters is how you can control these behavioral biases so that you minimize them. But you cannot escape from these biases 100% of time even if you are aware of them. That's what makes these things quite fascinating. And I thought that this is a very interesting topic to talk about. And one thing to note is that among these biases, there are many overlaps. So you can say that in certain situations, uh, one bias is applicable uh, and also the other biases might be applicable at the same time. So once you learn all these biases, you should be able to understand how you can apply these biases into real life situations. So let's just talk about them uh, one by one. And as I mentioned on today's show, I want to talk about cognitive biases from belief, perseverance, errors. What that means is that once you have certain beliefs in your mind, that specific belief is going to persist over time. So it's not easy to change that belief. So let me just list items that we want to talk about here. First, we want to talk about conservatism bias. Second, confirmation bias. Third, representativeness bias. And illusion of control bias. And lastly, hindsight bias. So these are five items that I want to discuss on today's show. First item is conservatism bias. So what is it? Conservatism bias is a belief perseverance bias in which people maintain their prior views or forecasts by inadequately incorporating new information. 
So people tend to overweight initial belief about probabilities and outcomes and underweight new information. So I'm going to talk about recency bias in the future episodes. So it's kind of opposite of that. But here, you're basically saying that you tend to put more weight on whatever initial information that you acquire and later ignore new information. So let me give you a couple of examples here. So many stock analysts invest a significant amount of their time to research their stocks and publish ratings for those stocks. So once they publish those ratings, they tend to stick with their original view and only change their ratings when presented with indisputable evidence. So they tend to stick with their original views. And this also has to do some ego um, because once you say something publicly, it's not easy to change. And once you invest a significant amount of time doing the analysis, then it's not easy to change your view even after you receive new information that contradicts with your original view. So think about your situation, see if it, this is applicable for you as well, and think about your stock purchasing experience and see if you fall into this trap. But what I like to say is that sometimes it's not always bad to have this bias because if you want to be a long-term investor, you want to have firm ground into your analysis. So, But also at the same time, what this bias is telling you is that you might have to be objective in terms of incorporating new views and new information into your analysis. So every now and then, let's say every quarter, the companies publish their quarterly results and every year they have annual reports. And whenever you have these results and see if your original analysis has to be modified based on this new information. That's the first thing that I would recommend. The second, you also need to write down your rationale for any buying decisions. So let's say you want to buy stock A. Then what you have to do is you have to write down your rationale in an objective manner on a piece of paper so that later if new information comes in, then you have to assess whether it's important for you to revise your original initial assessment of that stock. And you might have to update your rationale on a regular basis, uh, but not too often, as I mentioned. If you think that the information that just came in is probably not worth that much and it's not material, then you probably want to stick with your original assessment. You strike a balance between sticking with your original assessment versus incorporating new information. Because we are always swamped with tons of information from uh, different sources and you want to make sure that which one is you know material and which one is immaterial from owning stock perspective and if you tend to be vulnerable to all these new pieces of information too often then also you're probably not going to hold on to your stock and you're not going to be a long-term investor so you always have to strike that balance that's what i wanted to say Let's move on to the second bias for today. The second bias is called confirmation bias. This is so prevalent in everyday life. So let me just say what it is and then give you uh, some examples. People tend to look for and notice what confirms their beliefs and ignore or undervalue what contradicts their beliefs. This is a very strong cognitive bias. For example, Republicans watch Fox News, whereas Democrats tend to watch CNN because they want to reinforce their existing beliefs. They don't want to hear other people's sides. And this is very strong when it comes to politics or religion. And you tend to listen to whatever information that confirms your original beliefs. Also, let's look at the investing situation because investors may fall in love with a specific stock and ignore obvious warning signs. So this is quite important because people have this tendency to a certain extent and no matter what kind of person you are, you probably have some 
tendency、uh, within this、uh, confirmation bias space. So let's talk about how we can avoid this confirmation bias. The first thing you can do is actively seek out opposing views. If you are long on a certain stock, seek out the arguments from short side, because they may have a valid points about why you shouldn't hold these stocks. The question that you have to ask is: Is there something that I'm missing, or how do I know that I'm right and others are wrong? Because on Every trade, there is always opposing side. If I'm trying to buy something, then there is always someone on the other side selling the stock. So how do I know that I'm right and the other person is wrong? So that's a question that you have to ask. And also, whenever you have these opposing views, try to see if they have valid reason and check if. Also, the fundamentals are intact. So, whenever this you know new article or new piece of information comes out, and see if the it's based on fundamentals of that company or based on something else or emotional you know selling pressure. And the question that you have to ask is: Is the market overreacting to the news? And if the stock goes down, let's say thirty percent. On specific news, and you believe that that's not valid. It's probably negative news, but it shouldn't actually drive the stock that much. Then,、um, then you probably don't have to react to Mr. Market's reaction. So, confirmation bias, as I mentioned, is a very strong cognitive bias. So, you have to, you know, place some controls and checks so that you don't get influenced by a confirmation bias. But I can tell you right off the bat, I have some confirmation bias, and everyone has confirmation bias to a certain extent. So our job is not to get rid of all this confirmation bias altogether. And I mean, not just confirmation bias, all the biases that we're going to talk about. But our job is cognizant of the fact that these biases exist, but try to guard against you know falling into trap. Of making some stupid actions because of these confirmation biases. So let's move on to the next one. Next one is representativeness bias. So what is it? People tend to classify new information based on past experiences and classification. People have a shortcut to derive conclusions based on their past experience and intuitions without going through detailed analysis. So this is what we call rule of thumb. So whenever we apply rule of thumb, sometimes it is good because we can make quick decisions. But sometimes it's not good because it's too shallow in terms of doing the analysis. So you can take a look at or read a book called Thinking Fast and Slow by Daniel Kahneman, and there he describes two systems in our mental system. First system is fast, automatic, frequent, emotional, unconscious. The second system is slow, infrequent, logical, and calculating, conscious. So these are the two systems that we have, and sometimes we can apply system one, which is you know rule of thumb and shortcut to derive conclusion. And sometimes you you might have to apply system two, which which is slower than system one. But requires a lot more time to do detailed analysis. So it's case by case.、Uh, I'm not saying that you know rule of thumb is bad, but sometimes you have to apply both systems in order to derive the right conclusion. So let me give you a quick example when it comes to stock market. So a lot of investors have just simply try to. Categorize stocks into value category when they see low P ratio and low、uh, price to book ratio, and in most cases that rule of thumb works, but not always. So, and also when you try to assess the new management team,、uh, you look at you know how they talk and how they look, and just compare appearance to whatever experience that you have had in the past, and try to assess their quality based on that, based on that first impression. And I think that that's a mistake. So you have to actually look at their track record and look at 
how they have performed previously uh, in different companies and so on. So maybe you need some objective data to support your assessment in the new management team. So let me give you some very interesting study by a Vanguard Investment Group where they analyzed the five best performing funds from 1994 to 2003. So it's a quite long time period. And what they found was fascinating. So let me just give you quick uh, facts from that study. Only 16% of top five funds made it to the following year's list. So they look at year over year and only 16% of top five funds made it to the following year's list. Second, top five funds averaged 15% lower returns in the following year. Third, top five funds barely beat the market in the following year. Lastly, 21% of all top five funds ceased to exist within the following 10 years. So the reason why I mentioned this study is because people are prone to representativeness bias. So they look at just past experience and and they look at uh, these top five fund managers and they assume that these top five fund managers is going to do well again in the future. They so extrapolate the short-term performance of these mutual fund managers into the future. I think that's a significant mistake because based on this study, you know, these top performing funds cannot really maintain their winning streak in a significant amount of time. There are some exceptions to this study. For example, Warren Buffett was able to perform very well relative to the market over a 30-year period. But usually, if you look at this kind of study, it it tells you that these top performing funds would not really perform well in the future. So they revert to the mean. So how do we avoid the representativeness bias? So I think we just have to be uh, objective for uh, any new information coming to us. And potentially we can create a checklist so that we don't actually become vulnerable to our past experiences and biases and classifications. We go through this checklist so that we have methodical way to check uh, whether the stock is good or management is good. Okay, so let's move on to the next one. The next one is called illusion of control bias. So what is it? People tend to believe that they can control or influence outcomes when in fact they can't. So let me just give you some examples. When you buy a lottery ticket, you choose your numbers. And this is a typical example of illusion of control because people are willing to pay more if they can pick their own numbers. So they they think that they control the situation and they can win the lottery if they pick their own numbers. But in reality, that's not the case. You're going to have exactly the same probability uh, when you actually let the machine choose the number in a random manner. There's no probability difference between your own numbers and randomly created numbers. So that's a typical example of illusion of control bias. And uh, there's an obvious reason why the lottery company lets you do that because it actually gives you illusion of control and they can make more money off of that. The next example is traders think that they can time the market when they buy or sell securities. And as you know, and I, I talked this talked about this on multiple times in the past, the market is truly random. It's it's a random walk. It's not easy to time the market. But let's say you have some experience in the past to catch the bottom and you found really right timing and the stock actually has gone up. Then that experience is gonna give you confidence that you can time the market, but that was purely by chance. So you don't actually have the control when it comes to price movement in the short term. So don't fall into this trap thinking that you can time the market. You can catch the bottom and sell at the top. So 
I don't think that anyone can do that. So you probably have to forget about that. If there's anyone who can do that, then that person should have made tons of money consistently over time. But I have not found any person like that. Another example is that employees buy their own company's stocks uh, and they think that they can control the outcome of this company. So if you are CEO, maybe this one makes sense. Because, But if you are just one of many employees um, who think that you can control the outcome of company's performance, then I think you're falling into trap of illusion of control bias. So how do we avoid this illusion of control bias? Investors need to recognize that successful investing is based on probability. And they shouldn't really think that they have control, but everything should be based on different scenarios. And you assign the probability to these different scenarios and uh, have the right process to make the investment decisions. Always keep track of your investment trading records and assess if you traded uh, before just because you thought that you could time the market. Then that was the mistake that you made. Let's move on to the next bias. Next bias is called hindsight bias. People may see past events as predictable and reasonable to expect. And they may say, I knew it. I knew that's going to happen. And that's typical case of hindsight bias. In hindsight, poorly reasoned decisions with positive returns may be described as brilliant tactical moves and poor results of well-reasoned decisions may be described as avoidable mistakes. This is where it's important for you to separate process from outcome. Just because you earn a lot of money from a single stock doesn't mean that your investment process is robust. Because you cannot repeat the same thing over and over again. If you purely made money based on luck, then it's going to be hard to repeat the same outcome over and over again in the future. So if you fall into this bias, then you overestimate the degree to which you can predict an investment outcome. So how do we avoid this hindsight bias? Again, here you have to document your investment decisions in terms of catalysts, potential risks, and goods and bads. And later, when you actually make assessment to your investment decisions, when you actually try to assess how the quality of investment decisions that you have made in the past, you always look at um, your initial document and See if your investment outcome directly linked to your original assessment. Okay, we talked about five different biases today. I hope that it was helpful. Um, so let me just uh, go through them again. Conservatism bias, confirmation bias, representativeness bias, illusion of control bias, and hindsight bias. So these are the uh, five cognitive biases from believe perseverance errors. So as I mentioned in the intro, these are the biases that we should guard against, but it's something that we cannot completely avoid 100% of the time because it's just not easy. We are not just not wired in that way. In many cases, we probably have to be uh, aware of all these biases and try to reduce them to the extent possible um, but we're not going to be completely free of these biases i hope that you enjoy this show uh, that's it for this show and as i mentioned i'm going to create two more episodes about behavioral biases in the next two episodes so thank you very much and see you next time